We are beginning a study this morning of the Gospel of John, but uh, before we get into the text itself, we do need to adequately introduce the book. And so you're going to be handed a uh, sheet here in just a moment that will help us to uh, introduce the book. While that is being circulated, uh, there are a lot of good resources that are available for you to, um, to be able to assist you in your study of the Gospel of John. Several that are written by our brethren, most in print, some not in print. One such resource that I don't think is in print, it may be able to be purchased at certain bookstores, is the Firm Foundation Lectureship book from 1989 uh, on the Gospel of John. Uh, this was held at the East Ridge Congregation in Chattanooga. I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with the Chattanooga congregations, but the East Ridge Congregation is one of the uh, uh, longtime congregations in that area, a very solid church, very uh, outstanding preacher that's there. I participated on their lectureship several times uh, in the past, and their 89 lectureship dealt with the Gospel of John. Very good book if you can obtain a copy of it that used to be in print, but I don't think it's in print anymore. There's another book that was written by one of our brethren back in 1973 that has been kept in print since. Homer Haley, who is deceased, uh, aligned with the non-institutional brethren, but yet an outstanding Bible scholar in his own right, uh, wrote a book called That You May Believe, Studies in the Gospel of John. It's not a commentary. It's simply focusing on different topics of the Gospel of John. Very good book to have in your library for your own personal study. And then of the commentaries that I could recommend, the one that I would recommend above any else uh, by our brethren is the Gospel Advocate Commentary by Guy and Woods on the Gospel of John. If you don't have this, you need it. Uh, Brother Woods did an outstanding job in writing this commentary. I believe it was published in 1989. One of the last commentaries that Brother uh, Woods wrote, uh, he passed away, uh, I think, in 1993, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Brother Woods, uh, I'm sure many of you heard him when he was alive and when he was preaching and delivering lectures at our different colleges and universities. Uh, outstanding Bible scholar, uh, hosted for many years the Open Forum at Freed Hardeman, and did a great job in those, in those years that he was the moderator of the open forum. So I would suggest that you obtain a copy of that. The entire Gospel Advocate series on the, Gospel, on, the, on the New Testament, of course, is available. Not only in book form, you can also obtain digital, a digital series of commentaries. You have to buy, I believe, their uh, Bible program on CD, but it, uh, it uh, includes the entire Gospel Advocate New Testament commentary series which uh, you need in your library if you don't already have it. It has several uh, commentaries by David Lipscomb, a one, I believe, by Brother Milligan from the 1860s uh, the, on the commentary in the book of Hebrews, uh, as well as commentaries by Guy and Woods, H. Leo Bowles, and others. A very uh, valuable resource to have. It's not that expensive in comparison with many other commentary series, uh, but if you don't have it, then you need it uh, for your own personal study. As you're receiving this sheet, let me start by uh, looking at the top part of it. Uh, this, of course, is called the overview of John. Uh, whenever I teach a, a class on the Gospels, uh, whether it is the entire Gospel series or one particular Gospel in, in, uh, uh, of the four, I use an overview series that I have on each one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, based off of Rex Turner Sr.'s notes. This is what Brother Turner handed us in class, not this sheet, but these notes are what he handed us in class when we were taking uh, graduate classes under him uh, at what was Alabama Christian School of Religion, now, of course, Ambridge University. So, as you can see in the bold up on top, each writer, that is each gospel writer, was confronted with a definite need. There was a need for each one of these gospels to be written. He formed a definite purpose for his gospel record. There was a purpose behind Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each gospel 
being written, and of course, he selected his material under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We can never diminish or belittle the importance of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit being involved in the process. And as we're going to see in a moment when we go through the PowerPoint, you will see just how important that concept is, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the Gospel of John was written probably about 96 A.D. There's some uh, dispute among conservatives as to exactly when to date it, somewhere between 85 to 96, somewhere in that range. It was written long after the three synoptic Gospels had long been in circulation. Now, what do I mean by synoptic? Synoptic means similar. In other words, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar in many aspects. There are differences between the three, but you'll see that in some passages, they almost seem to mirror each other. Well, that has led to a lot of speculation, as we're going to see shortly in uh, the PowerPoint. The Gospel of John gives the portrait of the incarnate Christ. Unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John focuses on the pre-existent word, the pre-existent Christ. He also wrote to supply information not supplied in the other three. Uh, John includes details and includes incidents that you don't find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And of course, that was intentional on the part of the Holy Spirit to round out the portrait that the Gospels give of Jesus Christ. John opened with the pre-existence of Christ in the first chapter against the background of what was known as Gnosticism. Now, I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with Gnosticism. Gnosticism, at least the full-blown variety, didn't arise until about the third century. But it was starting, just beginning to take form in the latter part of the first century. It's the reason why you see John focus so much in his gospel, as well as the epistles, on that which we have seen, which we have heard, which our hands have handled. Uh, and it talks about the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John focuses on that in the first chapter of his gospel. He also says in, the gospel, in this epistle, 1 John, that anyone who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is an antichrist. And the reason why he spends so much of his time focusing on that is because there was a belief that was already in circulation among brethren that Jesus did not really have a physical body. That is to say that if Jesus were to walk on the sands of the seashore, he would not leave any footprints. Now, why were they saying that? Because they were saying that since all flesh is evil, and since Jesus is all good, therefore, they would say, Jesus did not have a fleshly body. Well, John says that's completely false. John says that is anti-Christ. And he spends a lot of his time dealing with that. Gnosticism was one of the biggest false doctrines in the church in the 2nd and 3rd century. And in fact, some of these so-called lost gospels that you may hear about, like the Gospel of Thomas and the Assumption Gospel and the Gospel of Peter and, and uh, such like, they're all Gnostic gospels. They were promoting that false doctrine. And the early church was aware, was aware of it. John himself was fully aware of it through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he was writing these things to counteract that and to fight it. And in fact, we have seen now a resurgence of Gnosticism among higher scholarship, as we will see momentarily. Uh, John's real aim in his gospel was spiritual. It was a more spiritual focus. Uh, of course, all of the gospels are spiritual, but more so with John because of the focus and the uh, purpose of, about which he was writing this. John omits the account of Jesus' birth. You don't find it in his gospel. He does not in, include the genealogy of Jesus' youth. Uh, he omits Jesus' baptism, his temptation, his transfiguration, and his ascension because that's not the purpose for why John was writing his fourth gospel. John is the one who reports the early Judean ministry. You don't find that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You do in his gospel. There are no parables in John. He includes no parables that Jesus taught because all of those are included in the other three. 
There are only eight miracles in the Gospel of John, and six of those eight are peculiar to John. You don't find six of these miracles anywhere else but in the Gospel of John. John covers at most only 20 days of Jesus' ministry. Now you think about that. When John says at the end of his account, there are many other things which Jesus did which are not included in this book. But these are included that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He also says that the world could not contain the books that could be written about what Jesus said and did. And I have no reason to doubt that at all. I am certain that there were many, many things that Jesus said and did which would have been fascinating to us, but which the Holy Spirit chose not to include. Uh, that is one of those things we'll have a lot of time to discuss once we get to heaven. But at any rate, the three and a half year ministry of Jesus is established by Christ's visits to the Feast of the Passover, which are included in John. You establish three and a half years by using John's chronology. Some of that is disputed, by the way. In fact, uh, but it's, I don't believe there's a legitimate reason to dispute it. The first Passover visit that John mentions uh, is uh, disputed by some uh, biblical scholars, but I don't believe there's really any um, uh, serious reason to dispute what John says. Christ appears under numerous titles in John. The Word, Only Begotten, Lamb of God, Son of God, True Bread, The Light, The Shepherd, The Door, The Way, The Truth, The Light, the resurrection, and the vine. All these titles appear in John. And all of these titles are unique and have their own special emphasis. And we're going to be talking about that as we go through uh, the study of this gospel. John wrote of Jesus as the Word. The Logos, if you want to pronounce it that way, or Logos, as we were uh, taught to do when I was an undergraduate student. You say logos, I say logos, you say potato, I say potato. Whatever, however you want to pronounce it, it's the word. He is the word. In the beginning was the word, John says. Uh, and the word, as he would say, was made flesh and dwelt among us. So the preexistent word, the second person of the Godhead, is focused upon by John who, by the way, is that disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, in fact, John, when he was chosen by Jesus as a disciple, was probably anywhere from about 18 to 21 years of age. He was a very young man. Uh, by the time Jesus was crucified, he was probably anywhere from 21 to 24 years old. Very young man in comparison to with all of the disciples who were young when they were chosen by Jesus, but especially the case with John. And the only John that is mentioned by name in the gospel is John the Immerser, John the Baptizer. He himself, John the, the Apostle, refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we know it's the Apostle because of the process of elimination. You go through a simple process by which you see the events in which the disciple whom Jesus loved is named in particular, and you go through a series of uh, exclusions. Who does this exclude? Well, you then are left with the 12 apostles, and of the 12 apostles, who could it possibly be? Well, it could only be one of the inner three apostles, uh, Peter, James, and John. So that would leave us then and some of those events with only John. John is the one who wrote, this, who wrote this gospel. And as we're going to see, he gives a unique perspective on several events that Jesus, uh, in Jesus' life and several things that Jesus said. And uh, you're going, I believe, to get a, a better view of what Jesus said and did through the eyes of this apostle. By the time he wrote this gospel, he was well into his 80s. He was an older man, and yet he still had that fiery temperament that he had when Jesus first chose him. He was nicknamed by Jesus a son of thunder, and it was because of his fiery spirit. Well, you see that fiery spirit coming through in the first epistle 
when he says anyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That sounds like somebody's got a fiery temper. Well, John still had it even at that advanced age. And when he wrote these things that Jesus said and did in his gospel, I am certain that when he was writing these words, especially when he came to the last night that Jesus was alive before he was crucified, I am almost certain that tears were flowing down his face when he was writing those things, as you're going to see. Because those events were just as vivid in John's mind as it was when it, when it first took place, when he was right there and it happened. It was that vivid and that uh, real to him. Of course, it was real. But in his mind, as the Holy Spirit brought these things to his uh, memory, and as he wrote them down, I am almost certain that John was moved emotionally as he was writing these things. But at any rate, we're going to be actually starting into the text next week. But I want us to look at this morning for the rest of our time is the gospel according to modern scholarship. Now, I've mentioned a little bit about modern scholarship and their approach to the gospels. We've got to be at least familiar with what the opposite side is saying. That is skeptics and uh, higher critics of the gospels in order to understand where they're coming from. So uh, as we go through, uh, how did the gospels come to be? For us, this is not a difficult question. How did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, come about? Well, all of us believe that there are four gospels because that's what the Bible teaches. There is the Gospel of Matthew, who was, of course, the apostle, also named Levi. There was the Gospel of Mark that was written by John Mark, of whom we read in the book of Acts. And then there was the Gospel of Luke that was written by the beloved physician, who was, of course, a constant companion of the apostle Paul, who also wrote the book of Acts. Uh, he wrote several sections in the book of Acts that are first person where he was actually with Paul when they happened. And then you have the Gospel of John that was written by the apostle whom Jesus loved. For us, this is not difficult. But for many scholars, it is not this simple. You see, when you get into my, higher criticism and higher scholarship, you're going to find that these guys don't really want it to be that uh, straightforward. You see, there are those that believe that Matthew... Uh, was written first and that Mark and Luke depended upon Matthew and then you have the Farrar hypothesis which says that Mark was written first and then Matthew and then Luke drew upon Mark and Matthew then you have the theory of Mark and priority where Mark is the first and most prominent gospel and Matthew and Luke depended upon Mark and then you've got the two source hypothesis where you have Mark and a source named Q about which we will say uh, some more in just a moment and they were the sources for Matthew and Luke and then you've got this you've got M Mark Q L and Luke's birth study stories which then developed into proto Luke which was then used by Matthew and Luke are you getting confused Confused? Of course. It boggles the mind. And my blood pressure goes up like this whenever I see all these theories. It is a running joke between me and Scott Gleaves. We, were, uh, we took doctoral classes and we had to study this kind of stuff. And it was always a running joke because whenever we started talking about Mark and Q and the four source, my, you, he could just see it. My blood pressure starting to go up like this. Don't get me started about all this. Well, what is Q? We talked about Q. What is Q? Well, it is not Desmond Llewellyn and the original James Bond series. You remember Q? Uh, uh, pay attention, 007. You remember that? Or maybe it's the modern Q from the modern James Bond movies with Daniel Craig. Well, no, it's not that either. Or well, possibly it's Q from Star Trek The Next Generation. Is that him? He's a, a very arrogant guy and a very irritating character. But no, that's not the Q that we're talking about. What is Q? Q refers to a sayings source. The first person to argue for a sayings source used by both Matthew and Luke for material not found in Mark was Christian Hermann Weiss. Notice Weiss. Sounds German? He is German. 1801 to 1866. Note that date. 
1801. Not the first century, not the second century, the 19th century. Note that. The first person to use the abbreviation Q for the German word, notice this, not Greek, not Hebrew, the German word Kel was Edward Simons from 1855 to 1922 in his German dissertation at the University of Strasbourg in France in 1880. He was later extraordinary professor. You know, I always get tickled when I, read, when I see that. You know, it's one thing to be a professor. It's quite another thing to be an extraordinary professor. You know, I keep on joking with Scott, why don't you call me an extraordinary professor? He says, uh, no. Extraordinary professor of practical theology at the University of Berlin. You have to laugh about this because it is so outrageous and it strikes so much at the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If you don't laugh at it, you get to where I'm getting where your blood pressure is going up like this every time you see it. The priority of Mark is assumed. It's just an assumption. A large proportion of Mark is, as this would be assumed, reproduced in Matthew and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are parallel in so many things. And so it is said, Mark was the first, and so Matthew and Luke borrowed from Mark. Mark seems, according to this assumption, to have primary order. Matthew and Luke, it is said, use many of the same words and phrases of Mark, Mark is more candid about Jesus. Mark is the least explicit account. And having said this, we need to acknowledge that there are evidences for certain, notice, certain sources in Scripture. For example, Joshua 10, 13 and 2 Samuel 1, 18 mention the book of Jasher. Do we have the book of Jasher today? No. Was it used then? Yes. It was a source. In Luke 1, 1 through 4, Luke indicates that he used eyewitness sources in writing his gospel. I have no doubt that when Luke was writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he actually sat with Mary and spoke with her and asked her about what she remembered concerning the birth of Jesus and what was leading up to the birth of Jesus. Certain things which Luke adds can only be from personal conversations that he had with Mary, of course, guaranteed through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, where it says Mary treasured these things, pondered these things, and treasured them in her heart. That had to have been Mary's comment about what was going on at the time, and the Holy Spirit chose to include that in Luke's account. Uh, then, having said that, this is far different from postulating a hypothetical source, which would be named Q, and speculating on its development, as well as even asserting, as some scholars do, that a Q community actually existed. Can you believe it? A Q community? For real? Are you really, are you joking? No, they're not joking. They're not joking a bit. In fact, they have reconstructed Q. Now, you know, an assumption is one thing. But when you take that over into the realm of this actually happened, that is another thing altogether. What are some answers to all these assumptions? Well, number one, the order of material in Mark does not differ from the order of material common to Matthew and Luke. Second, there are many agreements of Matthew and Luke against Mark. They don't talk about that a lot, or they try to dismiss it. The great omission of Mark 6, 45 to 8, 26 is not found in Luke at all. Now, why is it called the great omission? Because it is omitted in Luke. Luke does not even reproduce any of it. And yet if Luke was going to copy from Mark, then would not that entire section, almost two full chapters, at least some of it, be present? And yet it's not. The whole idea of Mark and priority gives itself over to too many problems. And the first and foremost prominent problem is it belittles and diminishes the concept of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
to write these gospels, it is extremely difficult for me to, to comprehend the gospel writers sitting down and actually plagiarizing each other, which is what you're really talking about. Plagiarism between the gospels. That is simply not how it developed. So why is all of this relevant? Why am I presenting all this to you as we begin a study of the Gospel of John? What does this have to do with us? Number one, because of the work and influence of the Jesus Seminar. The Jesus Seminar was begun in the late 80s and it really came to full fruition in the 90s in which a group of scholars, liberal scholars, got together and determine what Jesus said and what he did by casting colored beads into a box. If Jesus said it, then put a red bead in the box. If he probably said it, put a pink bead. If he probably didn't say it, put a gray bead. If he did not say it, put a black bead. If Jesus did it, then put a red bead. If he probably did it, you see the process. So you can see where this is headed. When you get a bunch of liberal scholars, how much of a percentage do you think they said that Jesus actually said and did? A very small percentage. In fact, the first book that they produced was called The Five Gospels. Yes, The Five Gospels. Because they are including the Gospel of Thomas. If you're familiar at all with the Gospel of Thomas, you know that, number one, it's a fragmentary uh, uh, document. Number two, what it says in that so-called Gospel makes no sense whatsoever. And yet Jesus is supposedly, uh, said, uh, supposedly said and did exactly what the Gospel of Thomas says. But it's incomprehensible when you read it. And number three, early Christians were fully aware of the so-called gospel of Thomas and said it is satanic. They labeled it as of the demons. In other words, not even fit to be in the same breath along the gospels. And yet, the Jesus Seminar would have us believe it belongs right there along with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Their work and their media savviness uh, influenced a lot of media because we had a proliferation of such TV channels as the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, and others such as PBS that uncritically propagate the liberal view concerning the Gospels. I never will forget Peter Jennings in 2000 had an ABC News special on the search for Jesus. You might have seen it when it came out. I recorded it on VCR. I don't recommend just anybody watching that thing because it draws heavily upon the liberal scholarship and especially the Jesus Seminar and promotes their view above everything else. Now, add to that the increase in biblical illiteracy in our nation. You take someone that has never once studied the Bible and they see such pro uh, programs as is put forward on the History Channel and the Discovery Channel and PBS and it promotes the liberal view and all these highly educated guys get on there and promote their positions and you take somebody that's not familiar with the Bible and they look at that and they say, you know, it's a slickly produced uh, program. Well, I guess that's how it was. And they're not going to go in and study for themselves. And the other side, the truth, is seldom ever presented, if at all. Q, used in connection with the Gospel of Thomas to rethink how Christianity arose, is nothing but fantasy. Since this product of fantasy is out of sync with the history of earliest Christianity, it is then maintained in all seriousness that this history must be entirely rewritten. But we are not obliged to follow cleverly devised tales. 2 Peter 1.16 The canonical Gospels exist. Q does not. This was Ita Linneman, who is a German scholar who at one time accepted the documentary hypothesis of the Gospels and Q. And in recent years, she has completely rejected it and has written a series of books highly critical of the liberal approach to the Gospels. This is from her book, Biblical Criticism on Trial. And then you have this quotation. 
Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect. Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded in a book the gospel preached by him. Afterwards, John did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. Who wrote these words? Irenaeus, in Against Heresies, about 180, the second century, toward the end of the second century. Now, this is uninspired, of course, but this is an early Christian who testifies as to the order of the Gospels. Who wrote the Gospels and when? He says it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The order in which we have always memorized it. That's the way Irenaeus said it came, in that order. And then this quotation. Clement has inserted a tradition of the primitive elders with regard to the order of the Gospels as follows. He said that those Gospels were first written, which include the genealogies. Who wrote that? Eusebius. In his ecclesiastical history about 200 A.D. He refers back to Clement who wrote toward the end of the first and the beginning of the second century. And Clement said that the two gospels with the genealogies were the first two gospels. So that again is an early Christian who is in a position to know. Who says that it was Matthew and Luke written first. And then Mark and John. So you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels written by the individuals of whom we have always assumed they came from. Now, before we move forward, Mark, as you saw in that last quotation, is said to have been Peter's interpreter. In other words, he wrote down what Peter preached. That is uh, what was uh, circulated early on in the second and third century that Mark took notes when Peter would preach and that those notes were used by inspiration of the Holy Spirit to formulate the Gospel of Mark. In other words, what we have in the Gospel of Mark is in essence what Peter preached in the first century. And if if you compare it, the Gospel of Mark, to Peter's sermons, the book of Acts, you'll see a remarkable comparison in that. But at any rate, you've got these early Christians that are testifying as to the veracity of the gospel accounts and the reliability of them as well. Well, how should we view the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Number one, and most important, they are all fully inspired of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Literally all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction under righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This applies to the Gospels. And if we ever diminish or omit the concept of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then you leave yourself wide open to all sorts of speculation and all sorts of man-made theories which have no basis in the Word of God. Number two, as we have indicated before, the Gospels were each written for a unique purpose. Each of these Gospels had a purpose for which the Holy Spirit, through the pen of the authors, wrote down these words. Number three, they all address many of the same events. So, of course, they use similar language. When you've got four eyewitnesses to an automobile accident, are you going to have similar language used by all four of those eyewitnesses? Of course. Is there going to be differences between the four? Yes. That's always the case. And it's the case with Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially, but all four of the gospel accounts. The authors were not guilty of plagiarism. Uh, You know, plagiarism is something that college teachers and professors have to deal with on a constant basis. Did this student plagiarize his or her paper? I confronted a student several years ago in another town which I was teaching. Uh, I had I just did a simple Google search on the first five sentences of what she had written, and it turned out the entire paper was copied and pasted off the Internet. 
And, of course, I gave the, the, uh, the uh, right grade for it, which was a failing grade. And she, oh, she was upset. Why would you fail? Well, because you copied this. It was plagiarism. No, no, it's not. I said, I've got the Internet site written on the paper where you got this. No, I didn't. I said, look at the address. This is where I got it. Word for word. Oh, well, you just don't understand. Then it's you don't understand what I'm going through. Well, plagiarism is something we've got to focus on uh, in, among college and, of course, high school and all sorts of education. The gospel writers weren't guilty of that. They were not guilty of plagiarism. Well, how should we view the four gospels? Matthew, I firmly believe, was written by AD 50. There was either a Hebrew or Aramaic uh, version of the gospel of Matthew that Matthew wrote first, according to the early Christians that write about these things. And then it, the version that we have was written in the Greek language. That is, uh, the gospel of Matthew in the Greek language was in pen for us, and it was written for the Jews originally for the Jews because it stressed and emphasized Jesus as king how he descended from the the lineage of David Luke's account written probably about AD 58 and it emphasized how Jesus related to the Gentiles it was written for the Gentiles written by the beloved physician uh, most uh, early Christians uh, say that it was based largely on Paul in other words, what Paul preached as he evangelized, Luke uh, based, it, based that gospel around his sermons and expanded upon it by simply interviewing those who were eyewitnesses at the time. He stresses and emphasizes, more so than the other gospel accounts, uh, Gentiles who were involved in the life of Christ. And then Mark's account, written about AD 67, as we've already indicated, uh, Mark's account was likely what Peter preached. Uh, when he was evangelizing the first century, it was written for a Roman mindset. Mark is a fast-paced gospel. The most common word that is used in the gospel of Mark is the word and. And, and, and. It just keeps on and, 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 and. just moves forward. For a Roman mindset of action, uh, Mark's gospel was especially suited for that. And as we've said, John written about 80, 85 to 95, wherever you want to date that, uh, written to supply information not found in the other three. Again, by the way, this is taken from Rex Turner Sr.'s notes uh, that he handed out to us. And Brother Turner said this, The issue at stake is inspiration. Are the Old and New Testaments inspired, or are they the product of mere men? A corollary of the issue of inspiration is the question of whether or not there is an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God a creator who is perfect in holiness and righteousness. If the scriptures are not inspired, how can a mere man be he, by his own intel admission, ever so intelligent and creative, as to account for the theme of the Bible, that is, God, man, and Jesus, the Son of God? I can see just as clearly as I could back when he said these words, I can see Brother Turner leaning back in his chair, sitting at the head of the class, and saying these words in his deep, deep voice. I really, really appreciate it, Brother Turner, in so many ways. And what he says right here is dead on accurate. But the Christian writer seems, and this is a different quotation from a different person, and I'll say who it is in just a moment. The Christian writer seems, by the usual course of the argument, to have been deprived of the common presumption of charity in his favor. And reversing the ordinary true, uh, rule of administering justice in human tribunals. His testimony is unjustly presumed to be false until it is proven to be true. This treatment, moreover, has been applied to them all in a body. And without due regard to the fact that being independent historians writing at different periods, they are entitled to the support of each other. They have been, been treated in the argument almost as if the New Testament were the entire production at once of a body of men conspiring in a joint fabrication to impose a false religion upon the world. It is time that this injustice should cease. That the testimony of the evangelist should be admitted to be true until it can be disproved by those who would impugn it. That the silence of one sacred writer on any point should no more detract from his own veracity or that of the other historians than the like circumstances permitted to do among profane writers. And that the four evangelists should be admitted in corroboration of each other 
as readily as Josephus and Tacitus or Polybius and Levy. These words were written by Simon Greenleaf in his book, The Testimony of the Evangelists, that was published in the late 19th century. Who is Simon Greenleaf, you ask? Simon Greenleaf was one of the premier law professors at Harvard University. Harvard. At one time, Harvard University upheld the veracity and the truth of the Bible. No more. Simon Greenleaf's quotation here would not be accepted widely on the campus of Harvard. Oh, they do have conservatives who come up there and get their PhDs, but the faculty and the administration and staff are not sympathetic to these positions. Simon Greenleaf was unapologetic about it. Uh, if you ever do a study on Simon Greenleaf, do a Google search on him. He's a fascinating man. Uh, he was responsible for a lot of uh, what we now know as jurisprudence in our modern society. Greenleaf uh, had a hand in all that. Greenleaf was firmly convinced that the four Gospels ought to be accepted as truthful and as factual unless and until it could be proven otherwise. And if you look at modern scholarship today, that is not the widespread view. They are to be considered to be uh, faults at worst or concoctions of the early church at best, not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the author known as Mark, the author known as Luke, the author known as Matthew, the author known as John. But yet that's far different from the way we look at it, isn't it? And because of the fact, you can trust the Gospels. You can. There's no serious reason why you can't. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote masterpieces. Not just because they're inspired the Holy Spirit, that alone would ensure it. But on their own right, each of their works are literary masterpieces uh, for brevity. You know, Shakespeare once said, brevity is the soul of wit. And that is so, so true. If you could say a lot in a few words, you have mastered the English language. And if you can say it in words that are easily understood, you're even doing a lot better. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did just that very thing. The Holy Spirit chose the words that they used, utilizing their talents, utilizing the personalities, and utilizing the purposes for which they were written. And as we enter into the Gospel of John, you are going to see, and I hope that, like me, you will be amazed at what John writes. The simplicity of his writing, but yet the depth of his writing uh, is something to behold. I'm not going to get into the text much. I'm just going to read that, those first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. How many multisyllable words do you see in those three verses? Uh, I see one, two, and three. Beginning, verse one. Beginning, verse two. Without, verse three. Everything else is one-syllable words. Yet how profound those three words opening verses are in the beginning that's going all the way back to Genesis 1 now you know we usually think Genesis 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth of course Moses wrote those words but here John puts a twist on it in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That puts a whole new perspective on what Moses writes there in Genesis 1, doesn't it? Because we see God pictured in Genesis 1. We also see the Spirit pictured because the Spirit of God was moving or brooding upon the face of the waters. So you've got God the Father and God the Spirit 
But now John, through inspiration, tells us the second person the Godhead was right there too. The Word. He was with God. He was God. The same as in the beginning with God. And further, all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. As Brother Turner once well put it, in the creation of the universe, God designed it, Christ executed it, the Holy Spirit finished it. In the scheme of redemption, the, God designed the scheme of redemption, Christ executed it, and the Holy Spirit finished it. And of course, that is right on target true. Christ, the pre-existent Christ, the Word, created the universe. Paul emphasizes that fact in Colossians 1. The Hebrews writer talks about it in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Chew on that one for a little while. By whom also he made the worlds. Gives a different perspective now the miracles that Jesus performs. Because Jesus master, has mastery over all the earth because he created it. God, through Christ, created the world and the universe. Uh, it's just a marvelous thing to, to behold, a marvelous thing to think about, to comprehend. That passage, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, was the very first passage I ever committed to memory. So it's a very special passage to me. But really, when you look at that in connection with John 1 and all the other passages in the New Testament that talk about the creation, uh, it really puts everything into perspective, clear perspective. Jesus is not a created being. As some of our religious friends affirm, Jesus was pre-existent. He was God. It is not as some... Uh, so-called translation says the word was a God. That's not how you translate it at all. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were created by him or made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Ephesians 3, 9, Colossians 1, 16 emphasize that creation fact concerning Christ as is the case with Hebrews 1. Well, we've run out of time. So let's go ahead and end this today and then we'll start 